This is Lois Gates. I am interviewing Joseph N. Stein and Colstrom. Okay, I'm going to start just with a little bit of your background. You grew up in Cold Spring. Yes. Okay. Um, when were you born? When? Yeah. November 3rd, 1918. Okay. When did you go into the service? June of 1944. June of 44. Were you drafted? Yes. Okay. Um... How long, uh, let's see, when you went in, where'd you go first? Fort Snelling. Okay. Talk about uh, what happened there. and, and Well, that was just an induction center. You were okay. there for uh, a week is all we were there about. And then you went to basic training, which was Buckley Field in Denver, Colorado. Okay, when you when you went yeah. to to Colorado, did you know where you were going? Where, oh yeah. Okay, were you, did you go to a specialized school in Colorado? No, no, it was just basic training there. It, the whole train load of guys went out there from here. You went in the army tra train load. And we went out to there, and you went for basic training. That's all you went there for. Okay, what kind of basic training did you get? This is June of '44. This is D-Day, the Normandy invasion. Did they? Did you? get the same kind of basic training that everybody did, or were they pushing you through kind of fast? No, I don't think so. Same training. I mean, it was uh, how to handle a rifle, marching, and uh, and uh, oh, I don't know, you sneak up on a building, I mean, uh, so you camouflaging, you had to look for camouflage people and then after all try to camouflage and hide yourself in a place and so it was a basic training I you got to learn to take your rifle apart and in fact I never did though I mean I never had to do that over there <laughs> I, I just got to the next place is when I took my rifle apart by myself and that and cleaned it up and that where was the next place uh, Geiger Field in uh, uh, Washington. Okay, now is that another training? Yeah, but there you there you started going for specializing. I mean stuff. I was an electrician. I went to some school there how to run the generators and stuff like that. The generators they had schooling on that. And then they, had, they still had some basic training too. Warfare, chemical warfare. You had to go through the gas mask. You'll put them on going uh, in the gas chambers, I mean, and see how it was when they had them on, I mean. And then you got to learn how to run. I, I learned how to run a grader at one time. See, this way, we, we, we were in the Army Air Force engineers, is what the, our outfit was, I mean. So you you had all kinds of jobs, I mean, that you learned, I mean. Okay, how long were you there at Geiger Field? Oh, let me see. That would have been about, uh, no, it was 18 months. No, it was eight months overseas. A year. I was there about uh, 10, 11 months. 10 months. Okay, so that yeah. would have been like in the spring of 45. Yeah, something like that. Okay. That's when we pulled out for overseas then. Okay. Uh, where did you go? Did you go straight from from Geiger across? We went to Fort Lewis. That's where the shipping out place was. We were there just... I mean, by that time you had your equipment already and stuff. They had to load up the, load up the equipment and stuff like that, get in the ships and that, and then we took off after that. Did you go over as part of a, a a group? I mean, were you together from no, there was, Geiger uh, Field already, or did you no, go there were more than, there were more than uh, just Geiger Field who went together. And there was uh, 12 LSTs went out together from Washington, 
We went down to Hawaii, and from there we went over to Aishima on the 40, 48 days on the ships we were <laughs> going across. That's a long time. Yeah. Well, those are slow moving goods. They're landing barges that you go on, but they, they carried all our equipment, all these graders and tractors and caterpillars and all that stuff. They were in the bottom of them ships, see. So you were going over there, you're an engineering group. What were you supposed to be going over there to do? Build airstrips and stuff like that, roads. That's that's what we did, I mean, the, as a unit, I mean, see. Yeah. They built, built three airstrips on the place and the roads all over the island there. There was nothing like that on the island when we got there. They built all that stuff up, I mean. That's, that was our job, I mean. So when you got there, 48 days, traveling was, that's more than a month and a half yeah, on travel five. time. So did you get but over there? Like we did get uh, we did a, get a break at Hawaii. We got off, could get off the ship for a while there. And then there was another island. I don't know what the name of that one was no more. In the in the Guam group, where we were stationed there, we were there for a week. We stayed on board ship, but every day you could go to shore. You could play softball or drink beer, and <laughs> that was part of your forty-eight days. Yeah. Okay, so then the travel time was a little bit less. Yeah, it wasn't quite that long. But to you travel. must have you must have got over to Aishima, May, something like that. Maybe. Oh, May. Let's see, I'm forty. I, uh, I was 18 months over, eight months overseas. No, wait a minute. Well, that doesn't quite come out. I had more time overseas. I had a year about overseas and eight months in the States. So it would have been a little earlier when I went. Uh, okay, so you uh, went over earlier. Yeah. I, uh, we were there until uh, on... Uh, Aishima, we must have got there in 1944. That was only about three months that I was in the States at that time. Only four months when we when we got over there. Didn't We were in the States very long the first time. So we, we got over there in uh, June, July, August, September, October. Or November, about in we went over that. Oh hell no! It wasn't that time we we were going over there during Easter time. We were so going you went over, over in the spring. Yeah, in the but spring. But you left maybe left a little earlier. Yeah, we, uh, we went over. We got there in spring, because <coughs> it was Easter when we were on board ship going over there. That I know. We had, uh, we were uh, it was Easter when we went over there. Okay, Aishima. That's the only place you were over there. You were on, on that island all the time. No, we went up to Japan after a while. Oh. When we when we left there, we went up to Japan after the end of the war. Did you work in Japan, or did were you just there? Yeah, we were supposed to work. <laughs> the war was over. No, we worked much. The war, we, we they had an airstrip there that they were fixing up, and uh, they built a. a Head, I mean, a uh, place for the communication center at the place, kind of, to, to, when the airplanes came in and stuff to talk to them. And we were we were doing some wiring there, and I, I worked for two months on it, and we didn't have it done yet. And it was just <laughs> a small place, but we didn't do much work. I mean, nobody worked much the war. The Where war was, was that, in Japan? Oh, God, what's, what's the name of that place now again? Hmm. If you just, can you hold it? Okay, so you were on the mainland. Yeah, and we we went by Hiroshima, then we could see the, the destruction on that, I mean, from the distance, I mean. The, that what did that look like? Oh, well, there was nothing there. It was flat, I mean. Were there uh, people 
around no, there? No, that's what I'm saying. Nobody around there at that time. That was right after it happened. So there, they ever had cleaned out of there. And uh, all the towns that we went through there that were bombed, I mean, the only thing that almost was standing was chimneys. Everything else was gone. I mean, they when they bombed the place, there was the, the chimney seemed to stand, uh, but the rest of the stuff was down. I mean, all the so way you up saw there. a lot of that. Oh in yeah, southern Japan. Yeah, yeah. There, there, almost every town you got through was bombed. That bad. And the I mean. city you went to was it hadn't been bombed, or had it also been bombed? No, that wasn't that wasn't damaged very much. They didn't bomb that one. All these port cities were bombed. All around, almost except for that one port where we landed. That one they kept for in the, if they had to invade uh, the Japan, they kept that so they could use that for going in and out. They didn't bomb it, didn't sink any ships in the harbor or anything, so they could get in and out through that on that that harbor there. Okay. You said you went to uh, Tokyo. You got a chance to go to Tokyo. Yeah. Just uh, just before we pulled out of there, I mean, we went went up to Tokyo, and then from there, and from Tokyo is where we got uh, shipped out. Then I mean, okay, let's uh, go back now. We kind of know where you've been in that. What was? Uh, tell me what a basic training day was like. I mean, for you, what? Well, got up in the morning and. Uh, First thing, you went for breakfast. Then you maybe would march for a while, have marching, practice marching, I mean, and stuff. Then you then you got went to classes on guns and uh, how to handle the guns and uh, and uh, I don't know what else they really. Well, gas. Handling gas, if they did smoke uh, screens and stuff like that, they'd have them going. I mean, and then you had a lot of calisthenics. Uh, that was about two or three times a day that you went through that stuff, running, and uh, had uh, uh, regular calisthenics, push-ups, and all that stuff. I mean, to get get in shape for that. <laughs> The guys not a, were too good in shape, I mean, when they got there that way. Well, now you <laughs> were also, when you went in, I mean, that was getting towards the end, but you were, you weren't, you know, 18, 19 years old. You were a little older already. What yeah. was the age of most of the recruits with you? Were they, well, were they mostly draftees at that point? Oh, yeah, and they were all older fellows, too, because the younger ones were all in already, most of them. They, they started taking 24-year-olds, see, then again. So anybody that was 24 or so at that time, they're the ones that were, the, before that they didn't take married people with 20 that were 24. Okay. But they started taking them, and that's when, why you got a lot of them about so your you same in, age. age. You were in with pretty much a, a group yeah. of people you're No, there were younger ones, there were older ones and stuff too. I mean, like basic training, they were all about the same age. Or there were some younger ones that were still, you know, being, just got to be age that they could be drafted. And then the 24-year-olds. But in, when you got to Geiger Field, where you formed your unit, we were, we were called a uh, Wild Deuces. The uh, emblem there of a horse with two dice on it and the deuces showing on it. That was our emblem. There you got guys that were in the service a very long time. That there were even people that came back from Europe, had been in the war over in Europe, and stuff already, and they came back, just shipped back, got back into our unit again. I mean, that was made up of all different people uh, from all over. From all over, yeah, different ages and stuff like that. They had. Uh, that's you, one thing you you didn't. You had a hard time making, advancing in rank or anything because so many came into the unit that were sergeants and uh, that were in longer, and you came in the, uh, as a draftee, as a private or so, or first private first class or radio, that you got right away after basic training. 
But then to get further up, I mean, it took more. I mean, I finally got to be a T, T5, they call it. It's not, not, uh, that would be like a sergeant, I mean. Only it's, the, they call it T5, the technical sergeant, I mean, it would be called, really, see. When you when you got to Geiger Field, did you have any choice there, or did they did they test you, or did you? No, no, just uh, more or less. <clears throat> I was electrician before I got to be electrician in <laughs> in there. Then they put you in the jobs that you were qualified for, to maybe at the time, you know. But like I say, I even ran ran grader for a while. And, uh, they wanted you to learn other jobs too, not just one. I drove truck for a while around out there, and that uh, just drove truck on that too, and that for a while. But the main main thing, I was rated really called electrician. That's what it was then. Okay. And yeah. that would be wiring up. When you got when you went overseas, or so you wired up. The tents they had generators. You had to get them set up, and then you wired. All the tents and the headquarters and everything up, I mean, with lights and stuff like that. You did the wiring in the place and that then. Okay. Um, when you were when you were on Aishima, then were, were there any uh, enemies left on that island, or was that... Oh, there? there was a few when we got there. The, they were hiding out. They weren't trying to fight no more. They just tried to stay alive and not get caught. They had caves and stuff. They'd be hanging in these caves and stuff and that. And I don't think it took long. Then there were none of them left no more. I mean, but uh, were there uh, Japanese civilians on the island? No. It was just was just strictly army personnel on that island. I mean, that had been on there, and there were no Jap. But well, when we first got there, then uh, that's right. That first night, a couple of nights there and stuff for a while. And we we had to dig down. We. I had guard duty. When he went on guard duty, you were on guard duty all night. They took about, at a post, they put about five guys. And then you had to decide who wanted to stay awake. It was so long, and they had to wake up the next one. He had to stay in, they wake up the next one. And and there was still shooting in that. So, but it was mostly way on the other end of the island from where we were. Now, Ayashima is just off of Okinawa. What, yeah. Had Okinawa been... Taken or surrendered? Oh, no, or no, they did there, a there lot was, of bombing and and uh, and stuff around there yet. And that that was, that, that was just just well, they were just being taken at that time and that. And then even our island and Okinawa after that, they got bombed quite a bit in the evenings after we had taken them over. I mean, you know, then the Japanese would send bombers out at night, but. Uh, they got in there in the beginning, but then when they got the Black Widows out there, that night fighter plane, hardly any of them got to the island no more. They got them before they ever got close to the islands and then. So you, um, well, go ahead. Well, then, uh, we, like on Aishima, when I was there, but all, I did wiring around there. And, uh, on the outfits there. And then for a while we, we ran the water plant too. I helped with that, I mean, they had water technicians, kept checking the water to see if it was good and uh, put the chlorine in it or whatever they needed. And then you had to have some guys, like I, I ran a pump there for a while to fill up the tankers as the guys, the whole island got water at that one point. Uh, and we'd have to fill up their trucks, I mean, as they came in there. And and then, it was an easy job. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Approximately how long were you on Aishima then? Did you move off of there after Okinawa fell? Oh, no. Uh, we didn't move till, till Japan surrendered. Oh, you did? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. Sorry. Oh, that was, I don't know. That would have been about uh, mm, over there a year, eight months, something like that. That we were, uh, well, figuring from when we the time we left and everything. I mean, 
eight months before we went up to Japan there then. Then you uh, were on uh, in, uh, on the mainland in Japan about four months? Yeah, something like that. Around four months that we were up there, I mean. Okay, so did you get to see many civilians there? Oh, yeah, we talked with them and went to their homes and and uh, they were the, right when you got there, you were There was a, you didn't see anybody in the army in uniforms when you got there. I mean, they all were in civilian clothes, and they, the guys even, uh, they, if they, like the one fellow showed us his pictures of a family album he had there, and then he'd be in uniform. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, you should say, because he didn't, that he was in the army, he fought against us, you know, stuff. He didn't like that, uh, that, uh, that way. I, but, uh, oh, we got along real good with him. I mean, uh, we went to this guy's place often. I mean, stayed there, went fishing with him in the Red Sea there and that. Was that uh, uh, all right? I mean, were you supposed to fraternize oh, yeah, with uh, them? There no, was no problem. Uh, no. The, it was just still like, like they say, in Japan, I mean, at that time, anyhow, the women, I mean, boy, they were sitting in the living room and so on. He wanted something out of the book behind the bookcase behind him that he'd call his wife in to come and give it to him. And then she'd come in and she'd bow and hand him whatever he wanted, and then she'd walk out again. She wouldn't find him. We'd say, why'd you stay down here, too, you know, talk? And then, well, I didn't. Finally, he said, yeah, he let her stay, I mean, but otherwise, she wasn't supposed to stay there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that uh, it was still the male, and even were going down the road, pulling a, on the carts. They had a lot of, they didn't have many cars or anything. They had two wheel carts that they, and the woman would pull the man around, I mean. She'd have a baby on her back, maybe, and pull the man around on the cart, even. And we, we'd stop them every once in a while and tell them they should change around, I mean. Dude, that the man would get mad. <laughs> so everything you saw was pretty primitive. Oh yeah, the, I, I, when I got over there, I just felt like, what did them people ever think trying to start a war? They had nothing. But uh, the thing is, they had a big stock of stuff on hand. They had stocked up, you know. But they had nothing there to, when the stock ran out, they didn't have nothing there to supply it. They had no factories or nothing, I mean, decent ones or anything. That was, they sure, with the way they're building cars and stuff now, they sure must have changed a heck of a lot from when they were, what they were after the war. Because they, they like you're making guns and that, factories, parts were made in homes, I mean, and stuff. There's one or two homes and work on stuff like that. They had no, uh, no decent factories or anything. But we went through a lot of towns, I mean, and looked through, you know, and uh, there was no business in town, no business places. In fact, in the end of the war, the black, the, the, the army was buying from the black market up there. They, they were controlling the whole thing. So that's... <coughs> Okay, I'm going to ask another kind of off a bit, but what do you think of your officers in general? Oh, we're good. I got along real good with them. Did you yeah. think that they were well qualified to be officers most yeah. of them? Yeah. Had, we had a pretty good bunch of people, I mean, uh, and uh, you could trust them, I mean, if they'd say uh, they want some men for a detail. And if he'd say, well, it's not good. It's going to be easier than what the rest of them are doing or something. You could usually figure, I did anyhow. I figured, well, I could trust the guy, I mean. And then I'd take the job, and it always end up, I did have easier work than the, what the rest of them had to do, you know. No, I, I, uh, I, I can't complain about the officers at all that were in our outfit there. Interesting. Okay. They, uh, and we overseas. Once in a while, one would try to buck the line in the chow line, but they got hollered back, then they went back to the back of it, too. <laughs> okay, uh, another question. 
What's your biggest complaint about how about your training? Maybe your supplies and, and maybe orders. I mean were there did you think that some of the things <coughs> did you think that you were adequately supplied for what you were supposed to do? Uh, no, that we were. We had all the equipment we needed. And uh, I don't know. I didn't. Re I I didn't really complaints. I really didn't have any. I don't know. I I thought, uh, for my part, I got by real easy in the army. I mean, I never. Uh, if I didn't like some work, I tell the guy, well, I don't like this, or I can't do this a little bit, or something, and then I'd get out of it. I mean, <laughs> stuff I. I was supposed to go help dynamite and stuff and drill holes and stuff. And the, I, I, just, I know the dynamite bothers some people. I don't know if it would have bothered me or not, but I said, I just can't stand that dynamite. Well, okay, we'll get you something else to do then, I mean, and stuff like that. Okay, what, well, you don't have any complaints about equipment. Your equipment was adequate and you had Yo. all you needed? Yeah. They had. Well, like what I worked with was like the electrical stuff, and we had all the wire all the time and the, all the equipment we needed to run that stuff and that. And uh, the motor pool and all that stuff, I know, and, uh, as far as trucks and equipment like that, they had lots of that stuff. I mean, all they, all they needed, I mean. Okay, I remember you telling me once about uh, your trip over on the LSTs. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I did, there wasn't much to it. I mean, you didn't do anything. You just laid around all day. Got stiff and sore and tired, I mean. I, I, I was, I couldn't stay underneath in the ship. If I went down below, I got seasick. But I couldn't see the movement, the way the ship was moving. So I, I laid right on top deck I got myself some blankets and stuff up there, and I slept on top deck all the time, all the way over there. I mean, when it rained, I went under the gun to it, where it was dry, and uh, I slept on top deck. And that felt real good. I could, I could go out in, in the, like on Easter day, we, there was no priest on our, our LST, but there was one on the next one. And if they, anybody wanted to go to mass on Easter, they had to go to the other LST. And I said, oh, I'll go to church then. And when we were, that small boat came alongside, and it was pretty rough seas, I mean, that day. But the, the boat would be right up, even with the top of the LST, and then it would go down there, and that, the, the ladder that you crawled down didn't even reach, I mean. You had to wait till the boat came back up and then jump in. I, I went in that, and when I got on that ship, I felt real good. That didn't bother me at all. But uh, a lot of the guys that didn't get seasick, they wouldn't go in the little boat. They were <laughs> afraid of the little boat. They didn't want to get in that. You didn't uh, encounter any kind of enemy on no. the way over there? No. One, one, time, one time at night they had an alert, but I don't nothing got anywhere as close to us, I mean. Today we were LSTs, and then they had uh, other ships uh, battleships and stuff following with us, escorting us, escorting us in there, and they never got, never got close to the LSTs or anything. I don't know if there was anything even that could have been just a false alarm too. There was one night they had a, an alert on though. Well, what was that like then? What did you have to do? Well, we could do that. I mean, we just, uh, <laughs> what, what could we? They, they, on these ships they had the sailors had guns too. The LSTs. They, they were called out, I mean, and manned their guns and stuff, you know. But to the Army part, we didn't, we just sat around and watched to see what was going to happen. I mean, what else could you do, I mean? Okay, let's go back to, uh, let's see, you were drafted. So you, um, you're drafted in June of 44. Were there a lot of other people from around here that went in at that time, or...? Ooh, I think the only one that I know of was Kinter. 
and uh, uh, Jungles was supposed to go in. He went down, he passed the physical and everything else. But when he got down there next time to get inducted, he had open sores in his legs he used to have. And when, they, when he came down the next time, they were open. Then they didn't take them. And this Kinzer was the only other one, I mean, that I know of that went from here at that time. Because we went, when we went to Fort Snelling, uh, we got down there, and then the weekend we had off, Friday or Saturday and Sunday and Monday or something, or three days pass or something. And uh, this Kinzer knew the sergeant that was down there. Some way he, I don't know if he was a relative of his or something. So we got off a half a day or so earlier yet, so we could get out of there early, I think. <laughs> Him and I, we, we, we took a... I don't know how we got from Minneapolis to St. Cloud. Or I guess we got a bus, yeah. And then we'd hitchhike back from there to Cold Spring, you know what I mean? Okay, were you, uh, did you want to go in? Well, I, uh, John Alexander asked me if I wanted to go. I said, well, I don't really want to go. But I said, if I have to, I got to go, I mean. Well, he said this. There was a bunch of other ones, 24-year-olds and stuff, you know. And they kind of said, some of them, gee, they were after him. They, we were doing defense work, some down here. And they were, all of them were after John. If he couldn't get him a... Uh, deferment. deferment there or so. And I said, well, I don't really think I should do that. I said, if it's, if they say we're supposed to go, I should go, I mean. So then I said, I'll, I always oh, said, I thought maybe you would be one that would say that. He says, then I can maybe satisfy some of the others that are so scared to go, he said. So I didn't ask for a deferment anyhow then. I said, Okay, what, um, when you came back to the States, where did you go? Well, we came into Fort Lewis again. From there, we were shipped to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. I got discharged at Camp, Mus Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. That's where we got discharged from. Now, did that all happen real quick, or...? Oh, no, we got in there... Well, we got to uh, Fort Lewis beginning of December, and it was in January... 12th or so when we got out, uh, it took a month about, a little better than a month, to get uh, discharged. <laughs> they didn't care from, when you got on a train in, in Washington, they told you if you leave the train and you get left behind, we're not going to wait for you, you're just going to get discharged that month later. I mean, they didn't care if you didn't get, uh, during the war, you, they were uh, uh they wouldn't let you get by with that, but here they said, it's on, you're on your own now, more or less. you got to see that you get down there to get discharged at Camp McCoy. Okay. Um, would you have gone in again? I mean, if, if, if you were drafted, you know, I mean, if you knew everything that you knew about what it was like and that, would you have taken that deferment? Well... You mean if I was taking the deferment the next time, if I could get one, if well, they got in? Well, yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't mind. The, the only thing, you missed the family in that. That you did, I mean. But, I mean, as far as uh, the Army life wasn't bad, I didn't think so. I, did, I got along all right with that, I mean. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. I mean, you, weren't, you were in direct combat, so some of this stuff doesn't really apply. No, no. Uh, but, I mean, you, you made a comment about the Japanese. What do you think about the United States policy after the war? Uh, what we did for the Japanese and the Germans and... Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, some some uh, guys have said that, you know, they... I've had uh, some say that they really uh, are kind of bitter about 
about the Japanese and how we built them back up and well um, I don't know how much we build them back up if, or, or if they did a lot of that themselves I think they say well sure sure we they spent some money from here over there but I I I think the Japanese did most of that themselves really I mean so you don't have any Bad no, feelings no, that didn't. Uh... When uh, you know, at the time of the Vietnam conflict, you know, your own sons were older. I mean, some of them were uh, in the service, and that. What did you think about that in general? I mean, could you compare that to? Yeah, I wasn't there. I really don't know if it was like they make it, how bad they make it. I don't see. There, that was, it's a little different thing there. Uh, up when we when you went in Japan, I would say like the people that were fighting, they knew who they were fighting. In in Korea or or Vietnam. You were in with South Vietnam and North Vietnam, say. But who who is North and South Vietnam? You didn't know. The, the, it, it was tougher fighting, I'm sure, than this this way, because maybe in this, even if the guy was in in South Vietnam, he could be a North Vietnamese yet, you know, and fight the other way, you know, and that. So that uh, there's not that's not the very uh, hard to compare that stuff. I mean. Okay. I would say that they should have, Vietnam, I always said too, they should have said, well, either they should have got out or they should have said, well, we're going to win the war. But they didn't want to, they didn't win the war. They, they didn't put stuff in there. They could have, they could have beaten, beaten North Vietnam, no question about it, you know. But I don't, I don't know why they didn't. They said, well, they couldn't go over so far, that's as far as they could go again, you know. But uh, that that was uh, why they made it that way. I don't know. What did you think about you know the guys who uh, who went to Canada or who refused to go? Yeah, I, that's just like this. I say like this guy that uh, this jungles. You know, he was. Uh, I I I think he would have got he got sick and died in the service. He was so uh, so scared of going, and something like that. He isn't going to do the. He wouldn't be no good in the service in the first place. Because when he had that sore in the leg, when he came down there, boy, he was tickled pink that he had that, so he could go in there and show that to him. And then when he, when he got discharged, he was the happiest man on earth. I mean, that he didn't have to go into the service. Now, uh, I suppose it's. Some people just have the idea they can, couldn't fight. Some people say, "Well, no, we we don't uh, want the religion or something." Says, "No, you're not supposed to go to war." And, and uh, maybe you can't blame them, but I mean, it's, uh, that that has got to be everybody's own conscience, I think. Well, I don't have a. a this is kind of short, but you weren't over there that long, and you don't have, uh, you know, battle no. experiences. No, that we, we didn't want uh, to talk about. But the only thing we, we got in the air raids. I mean, uh, even during the daytime, when we first got there, there was a lot of air raids. But that was a. I always said I don't know why the Japanese didn't. The guys that line up on the, this island we were there they'd line up on like at a football game or something. And, they were always after the shipping. They didn't try to really go for the people much. But they'd, then they'd be out there, the guys all line up there uh, like at a football game and cheer and yell and holler, get that one, get that one. <laughs> if, they'd, if they'd ever gone down strafing along that uh, top of that ridge, they'd have got all the people, I mean. But they just stood right out there and watched it, I mean. Well, um... I saw... Uh, suicide planes hit the ships and that they 
come from way up and dive right down, dive into a ship and that. I uh, actually, I, I the only, the only one that uh, I never really saw him hit a. If suicide planes that they hit a ship, they'd always miss them. I mean, except once they had an LSD that was had been torpedoed, and they they were going to drag it out into the ocean and sink it further out anyhow. It was crippled so bad. Well, then then, then that ship wasn't running, and the LS, then one of these suicide planes came and hit it. But otherwise, they never. <laughs> They'd come dive down there, and the ship would be this way, and they'd swing around, turn, and they'd, they'd miss them completely. Oh, that's mm. kind of hopeless anyway. Yeah. But then, then they, they talked about these, some of these suicide guys went on at Okinawa. They're supposed to go in there and, and get shipping or, or uh, run into the... the Planes on the runway dive in there just, but there was a lot of them came and landed on there rather than uh, with suicide. I mean, Japanese, but they weren't all that, uh, like it's always said, oh, they were all for the emperor that way. They, instead of committing suicide, they didn't have enough gas to get home. They'd have enough to fly over there, and then they'd run in, supposed to run into a ship or something with their plane. They'd Sneak under the uh, and the aircraft fire and land. I mean, and then sur surrender rather than uh, than <laughs> blow their sh themselves up with that. So they yeah. they didn't all that there's uh, that uh, fanatic as some of them were, you know, die and fight to the last man. They didn't all do that. Did you see any of the people from Hiroshima? I mean, you said you went past there. Did you? Oh no, we we didn't get that close. They wouldn't let anybody get that close to it. It was just off, way off in the distance. You could see that it was all just flat there. I mean, but they, they wouldn't let uh, any of the personnel get out or get close to the place there. Then no. Did you know what had happened there? Oh yeah, that was before we went. To Japan, see. Yeah, but uh, I mean, did you did you understand what that is? Oh really sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. That was all the news and everything already by that time, you know, and stuff. You could. Oh, we we knew what was, had gone on there, all right, and stuff. But see, that's that's what stopped the war. You might say them, the two places they bombed with that. After that, then they quit. I mean, they didn't. That would have been a tough place to invade was Japan. Boy, they had guns in the hills and everything. I mean, every road, bend in the road, had a big gun station there. If you'd have been coming up the road, you'd have got, you know. Now, would you have, if, you, if the United States had had to invade, would you have been part of the invasion force then? Would you have been well, part of that, or would you have waited? We'd have, we'd have waited a little while until they secured some place. More than likely. And then you would have gone in, you would have been doing your normal engineering. Yeah, I would have, like, say, uh, fix up the airfield again or something so that uh, they could fly, come in there and land in there and use the airfields and stuff like that, and roads and stuff, and that worked on that stuff. I mean, we, we wouldn't get in on the regular, like on Aishima, too. By the time we got there, it was pretty well cleaned up. Not too many people there no more. Japanese, there was a few still up in the one... On the way on the one end of the island, there was a kind of mountain. They had caves in there, and there was some in there. So we we weren't really uh, like figuring an invasion force. That's the island that uh, that Ernie Pyle got shot on. This reporter. Oh yeah. I, mean, uh, I had a picture. I got a picture someplace where the, they built a monument for him there, and that. He, he was. That was while we were there. There were still a few snipers left. That way they hide out, and then they'd shoot people once in a while, get a shot at somebody, I mean. Boy, and I tell you, like when we came back from the, the 40 some days on the ship, then when we got to like, go off on land on Aishima, we had about a mile to walk to where we were going to camp. 
I tell you, that was a bunch of tired guys when they got to that mile. We carried a full field pack and uh, rations for four days or so, their rifles, gas masks, ammunition. I don't know how many rounds of ammunition you had on you. And when you got, I know I, I watched, I know when I did that, there I bent back to sit down and just flip. Your knees couldn't hold you up no more. And, Everybody else did the same thing. It just fell down. <laughs> you know, you get 40 some days without doing any exercise. You might say, you know, that yeah. makes it pretty soft. And, you know. Well, what were your days like? I mean, I mean, you said you didn't really have to work too hard, but when you were on Aishima, what was the day like? Oh, <laughs> the morning, you'd check out tools like uh, wiring, and then you went and you did some wiring. Uh, at first when we got there, well, then you had to get the wiring in. I mean, you did uh, strung up wires and stuff from, from the generator to the all the different tents and that. We had lights in each tent and that. And uh, headquarters, you had to wire that up, some nothing fancy, I mean, or anything like that. And then uh, after a while, I don't know, I was just, Went in there and got my tools and walked around to see if anybody had any trouble or anything like that. And uh, oh, then I, I helped fix up an ice box. We, we had a washing machine that went to, the motor went bad on that, so I went all over the island trying to find wire to rewind it and I couldn't. And finally, I said, "Well, I'll take out one coil that was bad and see if it'll run yet." And I got it to run again and ran yet till. I, when I left, it was still running, I mean. And then I drove a truck for a while to take the, in the mornings, take guys out to where they had to work, I mean. And uh, I drove a personnel carrier, it was, I mean. There was supposed to be other guys doing it. But they were, guy, we, we got a lot of rain on that island. And they get so muddy in that, and they, oh no, they ain't gonna take our truck out and that stuff. They're gonna get stuck in that. Uh, they got four-wheel drives on big tires. They ain't going to get stuck. I'll drive them out there. <laughs> Take the guys out. And some guys work nights, too, and that's some that way. But I never work nights. By In the morning, well, I don't know. What time do we get up about? Seven? And by 4.30, the day was over, I mean. It was just like a regular day's work, I mean. That's not too bad. <laughs> and I, when I was over there for a while there, I, quite a while there, I took care of the beer. They got beer issued. I guess, yeah, every day you got two bottles of beer, everybody. And I took care, I got it cold and dished it out, I mean, to the guys, checked off the names as they came. And that didn't take long because well, when they got their beer, they were there to get their beer right away. <laughs> So and that, I, uh, that I got about a case of beer extra. The guys that had been uh, got sick or something, got put weren't in the company no more. One guy, I got, you know, uh, one was killed. Two got killed uh, just by accidents. I mean, not not. Enemy had nothing to do with it, I mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them had a brother, so then they shipped his brother back home, too, I mean. They didn't, uh, the one got killed there, and the other one went home, too. So other than a guy like that, they weren't there no more, but we still got got the beer as though we had a full company, and the extra beer I got, <laughs> that was about the easiest job I had. You didn't have to do nothing all day until you, you had ice, there and you put your beer on ice and leave it sitting there. Then you wait until 4.30 and then dish it out to the guys, I mean. And that was your job for a whole day? Yeah. <laughs> well, one day, sometimes you'd have to go pick up beer too. When you ran out of it, they'd go along with the truck and help haul the beer, get the beer in, I mean. Oh, I, when we first got there, then we, we, we control, we had the, uh, what they call engineer dump. Uh, the supplies all came in there, and then you from there they got issued to all different people 
like cement and uh, camouflage material and even Quonset huts and all the kind of stuff like that, I mean, they had in there. I, I took care of the cement, and all I had to do there all the time there was when a guy came for, say, they had an order there, they'd come out to my uh, place there where I was, I mean, order for 30 sacks of cement, and I sat there with one of these counters, and I counted 30 sacks, oh, okay, that's it. Then he'd take off, that's all I had to do that too. <laughs> but they didn't. The funny thing with that cement, guys would want cement for under stoves, they could get cement. Then the an aircraft gun captain came there one time, he said, I'd like to get some cement. He says, I can't keep my gun and my controls level with each other because the sand is shifting in that. He said, then they don't shoot straight. But he said, they won't issue me any. I uh, tried to get it. How much you need? I said, why? Well, so I'll give you all you need. I said, I got lots of extra here anyhow. I said, uh, I said, when I want one of you guys are shooting, I want you to shoot straight. So <laughs> I gave all the sweat he wanted to <laughs> so I could keep his two things in level, level with each other. <laughs> we traded stuff for that cement and that stuff too. I mean, traded for ice. And uh, fruit juices. Then we'd get uh, alcohol or so from the medics. Then we'd make ourselves mixed drinks. We had a refrigerator we built. Had that. In the <laughs> there was three of us worked out of one little. Sh we built ourselves a shack. Uh, I mean, and uh, we had that. We had the refrigerator chairs in there. And Quonset hut. This plywood that. Uh, when whoever was going to build up them Quonset huts after a while, they would have been in tough shape because there was no plywood left. And we, everybody took plywood home for their tents, laid that floor on the tents and that. And trading material, that was real good trading material. <laughs> you could trade that plywood away all over. <laughs> yeah, that was so you're kind of a wheeler dealer in the. Yeah, in that deal there, you did. I mean, you, you made deals all the time, I mean. Now, now was that's that a, just sort of overlooked by officers, or...? Well, I don't know what they finally did when they found out it wasn't there, I mean. Well, like the cement. When I got there, they told me I had so many thousand sacks of cement. And in the first concert, I knew right away I had way more than what they said. I could see that. And I had three Quonset tents that way, big ones. And the first one, what I issued out, was more than I was supposed to have, and I had three of them tents of cement there. So I could have fished out cement. <laughs> you know, the subway, they were way off on the count. I had way more cement than what they said I was supposed to have there to start with. Yeah, I know myself with the cement, and then the other guy had the Quonset huts. He would took care of, was in charge of them, and another guy had camouflage material and, and sandbags, and that was all good trading material. That the uh, sandbags too, they wanted them for building up around their places. I mean, uh, uh, for air raid shelters and that. You know, they used them sandbags and that. And, but that was all good ma trading material that we had there. <laughs> They had a lot of caves in them on that Aishima. That's where we, we used to go for the air raid shelter, run in the caves there. But <laughs> we ran in that cave all the time while they had air raids. And finally, they just didn't have any no more. They, they couldn't get there and stuff no more. They didn't have no air raids no more. And about, oh, a month later or so, when we didn't go in there, we might have no more to look for the cave fell in. <laughs> They dropped a bomb right above us one time, uh, but there were just these personnel bombs that they dropped on there. There was not really the bomb, but they dropped them personnel bombs that would throw shrapnel around all over, you know.
What was the, the weather like there? I mean, was it... Uh, a lot of rain. Oh, on Aishima, anyhow. And it rained heavy there. That would rain sometimes, boy. I remember one night, one night we were supposed to work. They were building a, going to build a road and they were going to, had to put a culvert in. And we were supposed to keep the culvert in shape while the trucks dumped the ground on it to put them, cover them up. And we were on top of a hill there, sand hill. And uh, it rained so heavy, we fell asleep there. It rained so heavy that it washed us down the hill and we were all laying down the bottom of the gully after a while. <laughs> the water ran off you and stuff and kept washing it down. We slid right down the hill. Oh, they had a lot of rain. And they had a typhoon. Well, that was just when we were going up to Japan. We went out in the ship. We weren't supposed to leave yet. But we were on the board ship already, and then they took us out. And we circled around and got around the side of it, I mean. But it was still pretty windy <laughs> that uh, when we hit that typhoon there. That ship rocked pretty good then. Now, they had a lot of rain. J Japan was more or less like around here, where we were there. I mean, it... Uh, they got snow in the winter time, you know, they had, and it was, otherwise it didn't, what about the weather like around here, I would say. But at Aishima, that had lots of rain over, that, that was a rainy. The funny thing down there, you could get a suntan. Yeah, we didn't wear shirts or nothing hardly ever down there. You get, oh, they really get a good tan on, take a shower and then wash right away. The brown. I don't know why. It never really, it never would say. You can wash the brown right away again. Now you mentioned that you got to know some of the civilians pretty well, went fishing with them and everything. Um, did you, I don't know, tell me some more about that, about what, what they were like and what you thought of them. Well, was it one got, family that you got? Yeah, to? well, it was just, just a man and a wife. There was no kids there no more, anyhow. But I say, they were funny. That was funny how they did their stuff. I mean, he had an album there, a family album. And then he had pictures of uh, girls even in there from other towns. And then he'd say, well, that was his girl when he was in this town. And that was his girl when he went to that town. And then I was at the, whoever he shacked up with is a different town. <laughs> that was in the family album, I mean. The, so, <laughs> that's, they're altogether different, I mean, than around uh, people here, I mean. I say, it's still like they, they say the Japanese women had a bow uh, every time and, and stuff, I mean, they, they were, you didn't wear shoes in the house. Even when we came there, you took your shoes out. Because they, they, they just had these the floors were just made of uh, straw mats. And if you got them dirty, you couldn't clean them hardly or anything. So you always didn't, they didn't have no chairs. You sat on the floor. They made tea for us one time. He was going to make tea then. And I don't know if he put two leaves in or one leaf in the, in the whole pot of tea. I mean, because it was just, as you could see, it was, wasn't white. It had no taste. So then we went to work the next time we brought instant coffee and we had uh, uh, condensed cream milk that way along sugar and then we made coffee for him and oh did he think that was something that was really something special I mean. <laughs> now was he an older man then you yeah know, was he the same one that was in the in service, service? too he had been I mean he was an officer in the service already, so he was older I mean and I, I would say that this guy was in his mm, 50s or something like that anyhow already, I mean, the one that we have, I don't know how we got, well, he walked around, I suppose, somewhere, I don't know how we got to talk to this guy, I mean, and he invited us home, he invited us fishing anyhow and stuff, even then we got to talking there, and we caught some fish too when we went out there. The boat they had, they paddled with one paddle out the back. Uh, had to work it and paddle it with one paddle, I mean. 
do the steering and paddling with that. Now I got him. I took a electric drill. I picked up one place, and I wanted to. He, I don't know what he wrote me. He said it was he's giving me a bill of sales to uh, so I could say he sold that drill to me. See. I don't know if it <laughs> would have meant anything or not, but I had it with me for a while. I, uh, I picked it up at some... That was in a kind of a factory deal there. Uh, had it in the, had the drill there. I thought, well, it looks like drill I take home with me, so I took it along. So he gave it you the drill? No, he gave me a bill of sales. Oh, and you gave him the drill? No. I, he gave me a bill of sales that he sold the drill to me. Oh, okay. So after that, then I could take it through as though not that I had just picked it up someplace, see. Oh. oh, they weren't, like you say, too. I always said, oh, the Japanese are so, the emperor means everything. I wanted to buy a Japanese flag, get a Japanese flag, and... Uh, Uptown one day, gee, there was one, a guy had one flying there, nice one, I mean, a silk flag and that. Uh, see what if I can get that flag from him. I went to the house and I, we, we could talk. Uh, they knew a little English we, uh, and stuff, and I, anyway, I said I wanted to buy that flag. Oh, no, 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 I can't take flag down today. Emperor Hi Hirohito's day. I have to fly the flag on that day. So I finally pulled out a carton of cigarettes and two chocolate bars, and I said, I'll give you this for the flag. Down the flag came, and I got the flag for that. <laughs> so he wasn't uh, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when the war was over, that black market, they bought, you could sell cigarettes to them and anything. I mean, they were... They, and they paid ten dollars a carton for cigarettes. You could buy them at the PX for, for a dollar a carton, and sell them to them for ten. I mean, then the guys even went to work and they took the cigarettes out and stuffed it with paper and sold them to them. And the next guy, the guy come, he opened up the ends and looked. I mean, so then they had stuff. Oh no, no, not them box. He wouldn't take them. So then they put paper in the middle and. Two packets on each head. <laughs> and then finally I opened the whole thing up to see if he had the whole carton. <laughs> you know, funny thing, they were always, that's one thing I couldn't, um, they were talking about the, how they were starving around there, the Japanese, you know, after the war and stuff and that. And you'd go out there in the country and you'd see grain, uh, rice fields, big rice fields, but all the all the rice fields were, were what they called black rice, or so. That's the only thing they could use that was to make beer. They didn't raise it. Why? Why didn't they raise the other rice? I mean, if they were starving at all. But the the the, the rice they raised was for making beer. Almost all of it. Hmm. Little patches around in by each home or something. They had a little patch maybe or something place that they'd raise some rice. But they did uh, like sweet potatoes. All summer they kept picking off the leaves and making, using that for cooking them up. Then in the fall, then they'd dig up the potatoes and eat them too, yet, I mean, you know. I suppose they cooked with something like spinach or something, them leaves. Everything covers most of the things that we usually talk about. Um, yeah. else you want to say? No, I don't. Uh, 